is, of course. Uh, all right, great. So, hello, everybody, and welcome to um, an introduction to what TQFT is. Um, so today, I'll just be talking about very simple uh, guises of topological effects that you might encounter in QFT. And I won't be going into too much detail about the uh, underlying topological theory, right? And also, I won't just just a technical reminder. I'm not gonna. I won't be able to tag uh, tab in and out of the whiteboard to see chats in the Discord. So, if there are any questions, you know, speak up, or I'll pause uh, in the middle to take any questions from the chat. But otherwise, I I can't see it because I've taken out my keyboard from the uh from the laptop you know to write stuff on a whiteboard easily um but yeah so basically uh what i plan on going through today is uh billy and trent simons so i believe a billion uh mainly means u1 so like the circle circle gauge group and uh, I'll see some applications uh, such as um, Quantum Hall. Well, um, maybe not immediately Quantum Hall, but um, uh, Hara Rodnov, Bohm, then Quantum Hall, uh, and also. Anomalous hole in 3D, maybe. And uh, otherwise, that's the plan uh, so far for today. And I want to also go into you know quantization and uh, quantization of uh, topological defects. Uh, and just a very simple example, like uh, monopole, uh, Dirac monopole. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that's um, uh, reasonable and realistic for today's uh, topic. So yeah, um, I mean, I'm not going to assume too much uh, mathematical background. So I'm going to introduce everything very physically. So I'm going to motivate what each of these uh, topics come from um, in physics, basically. So let us begin with Abelian Chin Simons. So where does Abelian Chin uh, Simons come from? So what, what's Chern Simon's theory, right? Chern Simon's theory is a topological theory, topological field theory um, determined by the Chern Simon's, Chern Simon's form, which uh, you will typically see as the uh, A, D, A, uh, and then you, use some, you, you have some three over two A cube, and this is for non-abelian, uh, gauge fields. So here, um, this is of course a three form. Okay, I said I'm not going to assume too much uh, mathematical background, but I'm just writing stuff down. Okay, so what does this form mean, right? So A, what is A? A is the gauge connection or the gauge field. So for example, you know, the vector gauge field in um, uh, ENM, and also you have the uh, color gauge, right, in um, QCD. Uh, so, and the D is the exterior derivative. So, for our purposes, DA, right, it's acting on a one form, so it's a uh, it's a vector field. So you can think about it as a vector field. So, or 
what we say a one form. So a exterior derivative acting on one form, that's the curl. So think about this thing as taking the curl of A. And also we're taking the wedge product, but that's not important. I'm going to go into um, an explicit, explicit, not be able to engage, nor for now. So uh, what I'm planning on doing is to explicitly construct this, uh, what's called a churn Simons form from a physical uh, motivation and also investigate the, uh, its topological properties, right? So first of all, where, where does the, uh, where does the churn Simons form come from? Right, so consider classical, classical uh, electromagnetism, right? So what's the action for this classical electromagnetism? Um, so you guys should be pretty familiar with this one. It's, it's this. Uh, so there's some constant in, in front, 4G or something like that, uh, 4G squared. And you have the Minkowski space, which is R4, and you have F uh, mu nu, F mu nu, right? DV, or, or rather I'll just write D for X, like this, right? So you guys have seen this, and what's F? F is the uh, field strength tensor subject to the equations of motion. What, so what are the equations of motion, right? So the equations of motion are concerning the derivatives of the field strength tensor. So here it is. This is um, yes, so it's a derivative and that's the, uh, the source field, but it's free. Right, um, so it doesn't really, uh, well, subject to the field strength tensor being a anti-symmetric combination of our gauge fields. So these are um, the four potential. Okay. So you guys have, have seen this previously, and also the equations of motion, right? Um, so technically, okay, technically speaking, if you write down your, so there, there's, a, okay, let me go into a little segue. Uh, first, there's something called the first order formalism. where your action is a functional of the connection or of your of your gauge field so in this sense this is not an equation of motion this thing is assumed so the the fact that f equals da is assumed um right but in the second order uh formalism Sorry to interrupt, have... just to check. Um, mm -hmm. Are you still writing? Because it seems like your screen has frozen. Oh, has it? Can anybody else confirm? Oh, never mind. It just refreshed. It's moving okay. for me. Good. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Chronom said that it's fine to have low frame rates. So <laughs> because I want, I want to have the. Um, I, I don't want my poor internet connection to be an issue here. So, um, but anyways. And the second order of uh, form formalism, your action is a functional of both the uh, connection A and also of the curvature F. Um, so it's both the, the uh, functional of um, your potential and also the functional of your field strength. 
So in this sense, F equals dA, which is this equation, is an equation of motion. OK? But aside from that, what we get at the very end, either way, right? If you have like uh, your, 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 you know, you in the first order, first uh, order formulas, um, first order formulas, um, you have your gauge field and also some current density, right? That you couple to your action. So this is nothing but for g squared or four d four x new 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 new, and also you add this term, which couples your gauge field to the current. So this thing in coordinates reads uh, our four new new rho sigma a. Uh, sigma j uh, rho, and it's a it's like a directional uh, thing. So you new here and dx uh, mu something like that. Um, but yeah, the the key thing to keep in mind is that the current couples linearly to the uh, the connection. So, of course, the EOM, the equations of motion, is going to read the A, oh, whoops, the F is zero, but the, the Hodge star of F is J. So, in coordinates, what does this mean? It means that the mu, uh, the, so, okay, so I, I think everybody should be familiar with what this epsilon is, right? So that's the, uh, yep. OK, good. And if that's the case, then in coordinates, this means this. And also in coordinates, this uh, new sigma equals j sigma. This, this means this. So yeah, it might be a little bit weird because I'm applying some, uh, let me control this better. this okay so this epsilon is the totally uh well anti-symmetric tensor for, for tensor because we're in four space right so it's a four tensor um so you see this sort of unbalance imbalance you see this imbalance of the equations of motion where you have on the one hand you have the anti or or I guess the chiral counterpart. Um, yeah, the Hodge. So this is called the Hodge dual. So so I'm going to call this equation the dual equation, and this equation just just the usual. This is the usual um, Maxwell's equation, right? And we have the dual equation which is also part of Maxwell's equation, but it's zero, right? So you, you may think to, think to yourself, why, right? Why is the dual equation to Maxwell's equation zero, even though we are, we're coupling to a, to a current? And the answer is because um, I, I think this fact is called Faraday's law or something, right? So ds. So over a closed surface, magnetic flux is conserved uh, so uh, let me move this whole thing down. Uh, okay, why? is the dual equation zero. And that's essentially because Faraday's law. 
which is to say that you have the condition that, um, so the closed surface, surface, okay, which is to say that the flux, magnetic flux of your closed surface is zero over the entirety of your closed surface is zero. So what does that forbid, right? That forbids these magnetic monopoles, right? Because um, currents are basically charged um, particles, charged particles moving, and that's a current. But then if you don't have um, magnetic monopoles, right? You don't have what's called a magnetic current, uh, electric. electric current but here we don't have magnetic current sorry this is electric charge electric charge and magnetic charge so there's uh, i guess physically no such thing right or at least that's what you what you've learned from um from uh, just basic uh, electromagnetism, because you're sort of taking um, the the way we sort of go about constructing this uh, classical electromagnetic uh, action is to start from the classical electromagnetic um, sorry the classical Maxwell's equation. So you start from this, and then you build an action such that the um, equations of motion for that action is Maxwell's equation. So you're sort of making an assumption here, right? You're making the assumption that you have a, uh, you only have electric current. So the classical ENM action has already um, the fact that you don't have magnetic monopoles built in, right? But <clears throat> like what, um, why why is um, okay, I'll phrase this question as follows. Why assume absence of magnetic monopole magnetic uh, monopole? I mean, just, okay, um, you, you're Faraday's law, but that's experimental, right? So you look at the physical world and you make a... What? So everybody can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Um, um, so, right. Um, Anyways, to get back to the question, why do we assume absence of magnetic particle just aside from from uh, you know experiments? Just aside from um, thinking about you know um, people in in the olden times sort of do these uh, very classical, very physical um, experiments and then devise this Faraday's law which tells you that you cannot have magnetic monopoles. But the thing is, right, mathematically speaking, there's nothing that stops us from adding um, another term. Because, OK, just uh, another perspective. Another perspective is that we start from the electromagnetic action, action, S, as a gauge theory, as a U1 gauge theory. And sort of build our um, action term by term um, as like a Ginsburg Landau type of, um, type, of, uh, type of theory, right? So what that means is that we add local terms you know, propor uh, proportional to the gauge field A that is uh, that respects the U1 gauge symmetry. 
Okay. So that's what we do. <coughs> that's the mathematical perspective from how we can obtain the action. Because you know, once we know that electromagnetism is a U1 gauge theory, U1 comes from the charge, right? So um, your um, charge objects sort of have this uh, U1, U1 charge uh, transform transformation and you know your gauge field is sent to a mu plus uh, or maybe minus minus e uh, partial mu of uh, phi um, so for example your uh, scalar functions which describe some um, like scalar potential or whatever um, let me just, or or some object that is moving, a scalar object that is moving in the U one um, electromagnetic uh, charge. This acquires uh, this transformation, right? So, for example, in for for a particle, a charged particle moving in uh, in, in an electromagnetic field, it has a U one charge uh, gauge transformation like this, and it's a symmetry. So from this perspective, we're able to build our action by just assuming that you have U1 gauge transformation. But, okay, so let, let me write down the other. So this is actually also um, just invariant. So the key point is that the field strength, field strength is covariant so what does covariant mean? Covariant means that in, in general, you know, in a non abelian gauge, you know, F, F transforms as the adjoint of your gauge, uh, gauge transformation. So phi plus Q. But, you know, for abelian gauge, right, you can permute these things. So G and G inverse can cancel out. So in fact, in U1 gauge, gauge theory, your um, field strength is completely invariant. Like you can just compute this from this fact, from this uh, covariant transformation. So what that tells us is that, you know, from the above uh, equations of motion, we have the dual, uh, the, the Maxwell's equation, DF, right? And also we have the dual part. So when we vary F, when we vary uh, the action with respect to F or with respect to A really, there really is nothing that stops us from, you know, I'm just gonna write down the first part of uh, uh, new, 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 but we can have another one. Right? We can have another term, which looks something like k over 4 pi squared, r4. So this choice of the constants will be clear soon. dx4, epsilon, mu nu rho sigma, f uh, mu nu, and f rho sigma. Right? Because certainly these two terms, Okay, first of all, they are um, second order and your field strength. So they're of the same order, of the same order in, in the field strength or in the connection. So it's a quartic in a connection. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, quartic in a connection. Um, is that true? No, it's a quadratic, quadratic in a connection. So. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and by any means, they're of the same order, but they also satisfy. They also respect um, respects U one symmetry, right? So, of course, <clears throat> of course, you'll know that um, if you have a action of this form when you couple it 
to a um, to a what well, you couple it to a current. So this term couples to a current. This this term leads. So okay, I'm gonna write as uh, Yang Mills. These are just labels for now. So this is just the first term, and this is the Chern Simons term. A. Right? I'm just calling the first term S Y M, and the second term the C S at the um, S C S. Okay, okay. So the first term uh, couples to um, to electric currents. So I'm technically here. I'm just making a statement right now couples to magnetic currents. OK, so what that tells you is that uh, if you add like, uh, like a current in general here, right? So the electric current is like the one form part, one form part, so that you, you sort of have a uh, And and R four, and you have a uh, Hodge star J. So this is the yeah, epsilon mu nu rho sigma a um, rho j sigma or one part which is the three form part. And this is electric, this is magnetic. And this enters the, um, this enters the, uh, the action in this form. So this is literally, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a new J new. <laughs> And this is uh, the epsilon rho sigma a rho j sigma, like this. So that's the magnetic current couples to the connection, like this. But the electric current couples to the um, connection like this. So of course, that's going to modify our equations motion, right? So the full, or I guess the symmetric counterpart to Maxwell's equation, the equations of motion will read something like this, right? It's either, okay, let me write down first the Maxwell's equation. Uh, this is J. Let me write down JE for electric current and M for magnetic current, right? JE like this, but also we have the dual equation, which looks like this now. Right, so it's a three form. Um, uh, yeah, uh, maybe I swap these around. It's not a main point, but I want to say the right thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, yes. So uh, I'll just write it down in coordinates. Like these, these equations are sort of easier to write down, right? But um, if I write it down in coordinates, I have um, J E nu, right? And also nu rho sigma J rho uh, J. So partial nu F rho sigma is J M mu. So we see this sort of additional symmetry being restored, if we just think about um, electromagnetism as a U1 gauge field, U U1 gauge theory. So when you hear people say like, oh, ENM is just U1 gauge theory, that's not strictly true because classical electromagnetism has this additional Faraday um, assumption built in, right? You have the assumption that your magnetic current is zero, 
you have no such thing as a magnetic current. But here, <clears throat> we see explicitly that if you just think about the classical electromagnetic action, just as a um, U1 gauge field, and then you start building your action just with the U1, um, uh, the U1 gauge uh, freedom, uh, or rather the U1 gauge uh, symmetry in mind, if you just have that property in mind, then there's nothing stops you that stops you from adding a magnetic current. So I want to focus on this term and why I call this the churn simons action. Okay, so in terms of forms, it's very easy to see that this is nothing but F wedge F, where F is considered as a two form. So what we can do is that we can impose the, um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a lie because like the, 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 the fact that you can even fix, okay, in free theory, right? So um, coupled to current, so it's not free, right? It's coupled to something, um, but up here, in this equation, this is free, right? No current here. It's free theory, of course, we, we, we have the equations of motion are just all the currents turn off, right? But the point still stands that in the free theory, we can have this additional transignment term, right? Because this transignment term um, satisfies the U1 um, local gauge freedom, uh, local gauge symmetry so, so and, and it's the same order as the yang mills terms uh, as our original um classical electromagnetic action so like there's a priori no physical justification aside from experiments there's no theoretical justification to you know ignore this term right but <clears throat> if we use the free e electro uh the, the free um Equations of motion, which is the, the dual one, the dual one, which says df equals zero. And on flat space, this implies that f is dA um, mu minus du nu okay, mu, like this. If we use this, use the free uh, electro, uh, free, free equations of motion then what we see is that uh whoops because the exterior derivative is anti-symmetric we have da which da but this is nothing but d of a which da right because it's it's anti-symmetric so uh, let me just write everything down here like this <clears throat> Because uh, because uh, because uh, D is anti symmetric, so it's you know the curl or or the um, the um, or just you know a, a sort of torsion operator that measures flux. So whenever you want to measure some kind of flux through a surface, you use the exterior derivative or or the um, or or the curl operator. The curl is symmetric, right? So d squared equals zero. So you apply Leibniz, Leibniz rule to this, and then you see that you know the exterior derivative is going to hit the first part of a, and that gets you da wedge da. And it's going to hit the second part, which gets you a wedge d squared a, but d squared is zero, right? So it's uh, anti-symmetric. And that's why we have this equality here. We can write f wedge f, this anti-symmetric combination of field strength um, tensors as a total derivative, right? It's a total derivative. d 
the uh, x, the four x, and you have uh, have some you you go sigma uh, a new partial row a sigma, right? So it's a part. So it's a total derivative. And it's an anti-symmetric combination or anti-symmetric um, contraction of something else, right? So it's an anti-symmetric um, contraction of a derivative with something else. What that means is that Stokes' theorem holds and can be used. So... So what does Stokes theorem say? Stokes theorem says that uh, the total derivative of uh, a one the, the integral over some region uh, omega of a total derivative of a form is equal to the integration over the boundary of that region of the form itself. So we sort of have um, this three uh, x. Yeah, mu, mu, rho, sigma. Uh, right, I have to pick a direction. Uh, v, I'll write dv as a sort of like a, like a rho, sigma. Uh, a, nu, d rho, a, sigma, like this, right? So n, n is the unit vector uh, normal to the boundary, to the boundary R4. So this thing is the unit vector, and this is the uh, boundary of Minkowski space, right? Uh, I think people are having connection problems. Okay. Uh, I can see it now again. Hmm. Yeah. yeah do, you mind scrolling, do you mind scrolling up just a little bit um, so sure. I can stitch it later? Sure. Cool. Yeah, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stitch it later so that it looks that you were writing this the whole time. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so if, if that's the... That's the case. Then I can also. I'm actually not sure how to export the whiteboard, but we'll we'll figure it out. Um, but anyways, yeah. So here I've written down the Chern Simons um, action in terms of integration over the boundary of the Minkowski space, or or just over R four. But um, while you may think that. You know, you know, in, in flat space over the entire region, you don't have a boundary, right? You don't really have a boundary. Um, but the problem is, right? <clears throat> well, I mean, that's true, but if, uh, let me write it down, but R4 has no boundary, right? It's not even compact. It, it ha has, has no boundary. So, you know, the Chern and Simon's action is trivial. Is, is that true? Well, equals zero. Is, is this always true? Always true? Well, the answer is no. Um, I mean, if it's always true, then I wouldn't be giving this talk <laughs> in the first place. So, how can it be not true? How can it be not true? So, first of all, you'll notice I'm going to go step by step, which is sort of rather roundabout, but um, you'll see why it's uh, uh, why I do this later. So, first of all, you'll notice that uh, notice the yang mills action, or just the electromagnetic action in general, involves uh, only f, only f integrable, 
you only need um your you only need your uh what is it you only need your uh, fill string tensor to be integrable um let's say so so what that tells you is that you know you only well square integrable so hopefully people know what this means l2 r4 so that means square integrable right integrable so what that means is that this allows which is a this is a global condition right global in the sense that we we know the behavior of um we we know the regularity or how well f behaves across a non-local region when we integrate it over that region right in force space like we we know how how good um it behaves in that region because it's in square integrable over the entire space we know that whenever we integrate a small subset of a four space of f we're gonna get a finite answer just thinking about Riemann integrability i'm not going to invoke uh Lebesgue stuff Lebesgue theory but the point still stands in Riemann integration it's the fact that even though we know how f behaves globally right we don't have any restriction on how f behaves locally so there's this um distinction between the behavior the um distinction between integration and differentiation is that integration is global and differentiation is local so we allow local singularities clarities this allows local singularities in F, hence also local singularities in A, so the gauge field. What that means is that we can have a, <clears throat> uh, a single point in space in which your field strength tensor is not defined, or rather, you you have a local point in space in which your uh, potential, your four potential, the connection is not defined, but your field strength tensor just doesn't care about it. So this is where topology comes in, right? Because if in the first order formalism, formalism, S is a functional of A, right? And if A is locally singular, singular, let's say at zero, at the origin, say, then the integration is really, really over, <clears throat> you know, R4, but then you take out the origin, right? So you you integrate you, the the space, the space time, um, the space time region is really R4. Take away the origin, because if you allow local singularities in um, in your connection, right, then you cannot consider the origin in your space because your connection is not defined there. In first order formalism, you can't even think about gauge fields that are defined at zero because the equations of motion and the, the action itself does not uh, require you to impose both global regularity and local regularity. So you can in fact have local singularities in your connection. And this is where topology occurs, right? Um, well, for the people that really know their topology, this is the three sphere. Well, homotopically, the three spheres. So you can th think about R4 like this, and you have a singularity in the middle. And what you can do is that you can homotopically retract, retract 
everything to the unit circle here, right? To, to unit circle. Uh, you can deform this, so you have, you have x goes to you. You just divide by the norm, right? And because you've taken out zero, you've taken out the origin. This map is in fact continuous and also invertible. So everything outside here gets mapped to to something here, and everything inside here gets mapped to something here on the unit circle. So this is the um, homotopy that uh, defines uh, the integration region for your churn segments uh, term. k over 4 pi squared. And this is the three sphere uh, ADA, right? 4 pi squared is 3. And you have like this. Uh, uh, let me write the epsilon first, and mu, Jesus, and mu a new partial row a sigma. <clears throat> okay, so this is exactly uh, the Chun Simons action, and you will notice, right, that this is. So I'll put this in quotes because not everybody knows this. This is uh, homotopy equivalence, and uh, you know, see Munkras. It's like a basic algebraic topological um, fact. <clears throat> so our turn Simon's action can, in fact, be non-trivial. Because here the unit normal is literally just you know you have uh, the unit sphere, unit three sphere, and then the unit normal is just this, right? So it just points out like this. Um, so you know the appearance of um, S three sort of explains why I have four k squared <laughs> in front. Well, technically, pro probably not, right? Um, but it is the volume uh, of spheres. Uh, volumes of unit spheres um, have this prefactor. But what about this k? What is this k here, right? What is this k? If we perform a gauge transformation, right? So a mu goes to mu plus i'm just gonna write um gauge transformation very simply without e without you know stuff like that uh, just adding a uh, adding a gradient if i do this right then of course <clears throat> i'm going to get um a couple terms so the churn simon's uh action is going to get mapped to well you know the usual churn simon's action and plus some other stuff, right? So I have, um, okay, first of all, I'm going to get a mu plus d mu phi and d nu, a uh, rho plus d rho phi, like this, and then you do the expansion. So the first term gets you the regular return Simon's term. Uh, the second term gets you something like this, a row and yeah also you, you get a uh, a mu d row d, oops d new d row phi and also you get uh, a symmetric combination of stuff like this but now you remember that you have the anti-symmetric tensor that are being contracted with each of these terms, right? So, you know, if phi is um, twice differentiable, so you can even write this down. You have Clairaut's theorem, right? Continuously twice differentiable, this thing goes away. <clears throat> but not this. Uh, 
Well, no, that's that's not. Uh, Hello. Hi. Can uh, anyone anyone help me with a circus problem? We're kind of in the middle of something right now. Can you come back later? It, it, it's okay. He's been muted. Okay, great. Thank you. Right. So, I think I'm missing another term here. Right. Am I missing another term? Let me just write it down. S3 and new, uh, new row sigma. New P, D, row P, sigma. Like this. <clears throat> um, Sorry, these two terms go away. Uh, and I think that's the only thing here, I believe. So we're going to do some um, black magic, I guess you can say, because you can, again, write this as a total derivative, right? We can, again, write this as a total derivative. Uh, I'm just go gonna go quite fast. The point of why I'm doing this. So the point is that you know in n spheres, first of all, there there's another fact, topological fact, or rather a geometrical uh, topological fact. Is that n sphere has equator equator and minus one sphere, right? So you have you project uh, your your n sphere. You just write it down as n one dot dot plus x uh, n plus one squared equals one, right? That's a unit n sphere. And if you project down to x n minus plus one equals zero, right? That gets you the equation x1 squared plus da 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 plus xn squared equals 1. And that gets you a n minus 1 sphere. This equation describes a n minus 1 sphere. So that's projection down to the equator of a n sphere gets you a n minus 1 sphere. So that's what we're going to do. Because we can write this thing as a total derivative um, of, um, <clears throat> of uh, the a uh, sorry, D uh, like this. And I'm going to just collect everything here. So I have um, S2 over you know, the, just the area normal to it. And I'm going to get like a partial of phi minus the partial of phi. So I'll, I'm going to explain what I did, right? So what I've done is that on the three sphere, on the three sphere, right? So this equ equatorial circle I'm going to think about is S2. But on the three sphere, I have two patches, right? Two patches that are um, homeomorphic to R three. So if you if you guys know about smooth manifolds, we have to patch manifolds together with local charts, right? So it turned out that for spheres, you can just use two, and that's exactly, um, you know, why I mentioned that you you get a uh, equator, on you you get a n minus one sphere on the equator is because when you do this local patching of uh, when you do this patching of um, the three sphere, uh, the the charts are going to overlap on the equator. So the overlap is the two sphere, right? 
the overlap is the two sphere um <clears throat> and also they have uh, different orientations right so you know the orientation on on the upper chart may, maybe goes like this and on the lower chart it goes like this so on the lower chart um lower chart uh, upper upper chart induces uh upper chart induces an orientation orientation on s2 okay but the lower chart is going to induce the opposite orientation uh, orientation on uh, s2 so that's why i have this thing here uh, let me just write it down with with you know gradients So now the reason why I didn't dot it. So the reason why I didn't cancel everything out here is because okay, we're assuming the gauge. Sorry, we're assuming the the uh, the connection is singular, right? <clears throat> so we cannot assume that the derivative of our gauge is also um, smooth. Even though, even so, so we no longer have no longer have smooth gauge transforms, right? No longer have smooth gauge uh, transformations because if you think about, oh, what if my uh, my U one connection is a pure gauge, right? Then if you still want to have the relaxed uh, local regularity for your gauges, then your gauge transformation cannot be smooth. But there's also no, there's always a gauge choice because U1 is abelian, it's Lie algebra is R, it's contractible, and all that implies that all the gauges are pure gauges. So in that sense, if you want to relax the uh, local regularity of your connection, you have to correspondingly relax the regularity of your gauges. So basically what this is saying is that your gauge, okay, whoops. What happened? Jesus, what the hell happened? Uh, it's probably not the best way to write down the total derivative. Um, ah, sorry, I did something, did something incorrectly here. Um, right, it's the partial derivative of curl of A minus the curl of A. Um, Times phi, yeah. Sorry, I I'm just making another choice of the uh, of the making another choice of of how to write this thing as a total derivative. Um, because I uh, realized that what I wrote is not correct, or at least it's not going to get get me what I want. But anyways, okay. So you you can write this thing as a total derivative of uh, you know. D phi phi rho a sigma yeah yeah like this and this will lead you to this expression so basically but again what I said before is completely um it, it's it's fine what I said before is it's fine but now you have the notion that gauge transform uh, or rather gauging variance variance of the transimons action 
there's a certain relaxation now, right? Because first of all, you have A that is not, you have A that is not um, smooth. And also you have phi, the gauge field, um, or, or rather the, the, the field that generates U1 gauge transformations. You don't need it to be smooth or even continuous anymore, right? Because if A is a, is a non-smooth pure gauge, then the partial derivative of phi has to have a singularity. And where do you get that singularity under a differential sign? And that's when it's discontinuous, right? <clears throat> oh, well, that's not necessary, but you'll see um, that for gauge invariance, that becomes necessary. So, okay, I'm going to write S2 plus and minus for, for the uh, S2 plus and S, S2 plus S2 minus like this for the upper and lower uh, orientations. So the gauging variance of this thing. So of course, you know, <clears throat> I perform a gauge transformation on the trend sum action. I get the trend sum action back, but then also this additional term, right? Which need not be zero now because um, I have, First of all, I have two patches with different orientation and also A need not be smooth and phi need not be continuous, which means that the derivative of A is going to, <clears throat> um, not going to cancel out each other um, point-wise. Because at a single point, what can happen is that, <clears throat> is that like this object itself isn't even defined. It's like infinity or something, right? And then you can't really say that infinity minus infinity is zero. That doesn't that doesn't really make any sense. So this term, uh, I'll just say this this term, this term, additional term is the gauge transformation of the Trent Simons action. And of course, if you want to enforce that this thing is zero which is the gauge invariance of the trend simons action, you have to make sure that S2 uh, of the curl of A times phi plus, uh, plus S2 minus phi curl of A is zero. But how do you, how do, how do you enforce that, right? So, Thing is, curl. Uh, right, the curl of A is just a magnetic field. V times the magnetic field. So you have the magnetic flux. You have magnetic flux on S2 plus, and you have the magnetic flux on S2 minus. So again, I'm implicitly using um <clears throat> implicitly using the uh, the um stokes theorem again right so this theorem again right but this is measuring the magnetic uh, flux and if we have non trivial non trivial non trivial magnetic current implies there's a magnetic magnetic Gauss law for Faraday's law in, instead of Faraday's law. So you have like S2 of uh, the magnetic flux, it's not zero. It's um, the enclosed magnetic charge over, uh, is it? It's probably not over, it's like mu zero um, enclosed magnetic charge. So it's non-zero now because you have a you can have magnetic monopoles when you have magnetic currents, right? Um, <clears throat> so what that tells us is that we only need the gauge. So so let's say we have um, Q M, and we also have um, Q. 
Uh, right. But then we have we, we have this uh, gate transformation here in the middle, but coupled with the fact that we know that we have a magnetic Gauss law with some magnetic charge, we know that if we have a discontinuity of phi, discontinuity of phi, we can allow a discontinuity of phi across uh, across. S2. If we do that, right, then this discontinuity can compensate for the um, and compensate for the uh, and compensate for um, the uh, you know the magnetic charge enclosed. In the in S two plus minus the uh, magnetic charge enclosed by Q minus, so that's a very hand wavy argument. But um, if you want to do the computation, it involves um, screen slagging. Yeah, so it's going to involve some uh, geometric arguments. But this is a key point, right? But how much discontinuity can we allow our phi, right? So the discontinuity is actually integral, integral discontinuity. So the scalar field phi <clears throat> as a function of, um, as a scalar function on S2 can only have discontinuity up to a 2D winding number. So this integral is actually given by the degree of phi from S2 to S2, right? So the, su such maps up to a multiple. So right now, you guys don't need to understand what um, right now I'm saying. But the key point is that it's characterized. characterized by the degree of phi, and this is an integer. So the key point is that it's as long as the discontinuity in your gauge connect in, in your gauge field is integral, then I can compensate for any um, integral uh, multiples of my magnetic charge uh, that I see on different um, patches of S2. Okay, so <clears throat> this is um, the, this is really the key point. So that's where the uh, topology comes in. So if I have integral, this, the, the main point is I, have, I allow my gate transformation to have integral discontinuity up to the degree of S2 to S2, this is of course in pi two S2 and Z in here. But like, again, you guys don't need to know this. Just know that there's a way to characterize maps, um, to, to characterize um, gauge fields like this. <clears throat> and, if we allow this discontinuity to compensate for this um, for for this uh, possible um, measurement of magnetic charges on different patches of S three or as, on different patches of this S two, then what this also implies is that k is k must be integral. This this coupling constant has to be integral as well, or, or rather, integral multiple of the magnetic charge of magnetic charge so that this gauge invariance condition forces the uh, coupling constant in front of your uh, so yeah I, I mean actually it's it's an integral 
uh, okay, yeah, this is true. The thing is, if you do the computation like this, then you, you get like a four pi squared times the 2D winding number. And, and that's why, you know, you, uh, that's why the four pi squared is here to sort of cancel out this, uh, this contribution. And, and, you know, four pi squared is the, uh, the surface of uh, the surface area of the two sphere, right? So uh, the unit two sphere, but anyways, the whole point. So let me summarize. Okay. Summarize. What's the main lessons from abelian transcendence? summary is that in terms of the action right first order action uh, first order uh, electromagnetic action uh, turn simon's term, term arise which is sort of like a chiral or magnetic uh, magnetic uh, Maxwell's equation, Maxwell's uh, Maxwell's tensor. I'll just say this: arise involving second <clears throat> that the 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 Chern Simons action is topological is topological yes so um i guess that that is the main point and so so the whole topological uh, argument goes that um it really is classified by it, it's okay so whoops overdid that yeah uh topological the uh gauge transformation uh is characterized by uh, just uh, by energy and it's a topological invariant invariant so when we talk about topological sectors right so um, each um, different each different sort of uh, the minimum of your action as a sector so to speak uh, of your um, physical configuration, right? So different um, solutions to the equations of motion are sectors in your theory. But if we have the trans Simons term and we allow it to be non-trivial, possibly non-trivial, it's gauge invariance, the, the requirement that, of gauge invariance is not sufficient to kill it. It's only sufficient to force the coupling constant to be an integral power, sorry, not integral power, integral um, multiple of some topological invariant. And this topological invariant is going to characterize your topological sectors of your, um, uh, of your electromagnetic field. So what I mean by that is each phi that is discontinuous, uh, this continue us across some two surface any any two surface really um well i'll just say s2 across s2 doesn't matter uh it is characterized by pi 2 of s2 and that's the integral topological invariant here and that's called the hedgehog the hedgehog anomaly so you can start building uh, your solutions, uh, solutions to <clears throat> solutions to uh, 
your total action, which is the Ying Mills action, as well as the uh, as well as the Chern Simon's action, because we know that k is integral, and if we pick phi to be discontinu discontinuous, um, such that it's characterized by an integer that is exactly the coupling constant, the integral coupling constant of um, so let me just say this is in Z if is equal to K in the coupling constant of your Chern Simons term, then you have a solution, right? If you have a topological solution to equations of motion of your total action, if you just pick A to be the pure gauge of, of this phi here, but phi is non-trivial, it's, it's non-zero, right? Because picking a pure gauge means that you kill the yang mills action, but also picking phi, picking your phi such that um, it's characterized topologically by the same k in your churn simons term also kills that term because phi um, just compensates for this k, right? And also, um, like for example, your e to the minus s a i s a is invariant. Well, but okay, let me write this down. It's a stationary phase. Two pi uh, s a is invariant. So technically speaking, it's not really a um, solution because you know your Chern Simons term is uh, non-zero. But it is a solution, I guess, in the in the quantum theory or in the statistical theory, because it leaves the Gibbs kernel invariant, right? If phi is um, is characterized by some two D winding number, well, uh, like a monopole, uh, so this is a, if um, phi equals one, so this is the hedgehog hog um, defect. But the thing is, um, uh, right, OK. What do I want to say next? Topological gauge transformation categories. Uh, uh, say it's topological if, OK. All right, so that concludes my what I want to say about the uh, Bailey and Trent Simons theory for now. Oh, I'll write down another one. Three is that uh, I, I sort of already already said three, so three is here. I sort of really want to drive this point home that the Trent Simons term sort of generates this chiral anomaly, right? So it's a chiral uh, current. And this is the sort of um, perspective you also see in not only U1, but also um, non-BLN gauge fields, so got like in QCD, right? The U1 anomaly in QCD is exactly this form, even though, right, in QCD, we did not have to sacrifice uh, the Maxwell's equation because that's in the photon sector, right? That's in the abelian U1 sector. The U1 anomaly in QCD is coming from the color sector. It's coming from the uh, SO3, uh, SU3. So there, there's sort of like a, a different interpretation of exactly what these um, topological um, defects mean in different theories, right? Obviously, but in U1 um, QED, for example, Right. If you allow your spin, uh, spinners to couple to magnetic currents, if you just allow your magnetic currents to be there in the first place in, in your action, then you can have different topological sectors. Then you can have different topological sectors in your theory. And that topological sector is going to describe magnetic currents in U1 abelian um, gauge fields. But 
the thing is, if that U1 embeds into some other gauge group, right, that can describe some other physical stuff, right? So like like a magnetic, like like a chiral color current, right? In in, in terms of QCD. But yeah, uh, and that concludes, uh, I guess, the first part. And <clears throat> uh, right, I'm going to pause for a little bit and ask if you have any questions. Yes, exactly. As um, Infinity Flat said, um, it's a large gate transformation. So in uh, yeah, so like in uh, actually in uh, like two D quantum hall, the one D winding number is exactly a large gate transformation. That's how people sort of um, understand it in the quantum hall context. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's the same really. It's a like it's the difference between you know. Um, uh, a billion year one gauge theory in four space or in two space, right? Um, but yeah, um, I'm probably not going to like like some of you guys might wonder, you know, why we only think about topological uh, such topological invariants like large gauge transformations. Um, in even dimensional manifolds. I mean, that's not necessary, but in odd dimensional manifolds, you sort of need uh, more stuff to actually build your topological invariant, like a chiral chiral symmetry. That's an additional assumption um, in your theory, but um, that the reason for that is related to like the, the churn class, which I'm probably not gonna talk about because you know, that, that, that's a whole rabbit hole. But yeah, if there are no questions, um, let me exclude the origin from the integral. No, okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to exclude it. I'm just saying that um, you, can, you can exclude it and not affect anything in the setup of your action. So, for example, you can exclude it and not affect, you know, the value of the action um, or the uh, variational problem or anything like that. At least in a weak formulation, right? That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Um, so I'm not saying that. Okay, you you have to do it, but like um, the fact is that just from regularity point of view, you can exclude. problem right and that's that's what uh, and then afterwards the topology shows up when you assume that you have a, uh, a singularity <clears throat> I guess that's yeah that's the upshot because like uh, at least from the weak uh, optimization point of view there's at all no reason to not to not include singular solutions locally singular solutions. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, actually the monopole is coming from your gauge connection. Um, so, you know, as, as you've probably seen already, uh, in, in the monopole picture here, uh, sorry, in the hedgehog picture here, you have the monopole in the middle, right? And also um, in here, right, where I just written down this flux. So that flux tells you that you have a magnetic monopole. But if I pick right, a different topological sector that's just characterized by a pure gauge, as uh, Infinity Flat said, it's a large gauge transformation over your entire surface, 
and that need not be uh, zero. That can be an integral uh, multiple of the uh, of the magnetic charge. So um, when you have so so technically speaking, your monopole is determined by your solution to the equations of motion, right? Because you know you you have gauge fields and and different um, solutions to equations of motion actually determines the uh, physical content of your theory. So that includes electric um, charges, magnetic monopoles, currents, you know, stuff like that. And if you can solve the equations of motion, then you're done. You solve the theory. But here, uh, what I'm saying is that you know it's quite hard to do that in general, right? But um, if in each topological sector we're able to pick the pure gauge solution, right? Then we don't have to worry about the Yang Mills first term at all then. And all the other things are sort of already satisfied. But then even in terms of pure gauges, we have these monopoles that show up. So the 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 um hedgehog, which is a very simple monopole, is uh, technically a pure gauge, but it's not a smooth pure gauge. Of course it's not a smooth pure gauge. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if there are no questions, yep. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's move on to Aharonov Bohm. I'll go through this very quickly because this is a very uh, simple um, and, and quantum hole. This is a very simple um, version of what we just did. Again, we did the 4D stuff previously, and we have this, you know, 3D Chern Simons um, theory um, stuff coming out. But in Aronov Bohm and Quantum Hall, it's a 2D phenomenon, right? So the starting point is that we have the, uh, the wave function. And I'm going to just just think about a single particle, right? A single particle wave function, um, psi of x. But then this is coupled to a U1 gauge, right? To a magnetic field. And the setup is as follows. So let's say we are on a 2D plane. And we have a uh, magnetic flux that spreads through. Uh, this entire uh, this plane. So you know, in the bulk of the two D um, material, two D material, and let's say this is X, right? In the bulk of the two D material, um, we don't really like we we just see a, a region which is called the region in two D. Um, I'll just call it like S or something. Um, which is called the flux core that we sort of that that your wave function can't see. So if you just think about semi classically, right? And and this flux is B, right? So your um, your your um, flux is localized in this region. Um, if you just think about semi classically. Your wave function, as I said before, is going to transform uh, in a specific way. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah, so a specific way like this, locally, locally. But the thing is, right, we want to understand how the quantum states themselves transform as you move around in the 2D plane, right, from X to Y, for example. Then what happens is that, of course, you have your, your wave function is going to transform, you know, the integral of from X to Y of the gradient of phi. So for now, I'm going to replace this as with my uh, vector gauge field, right? Because 
from x from x to y, I have the difference phi of x, uh, well, y phi of y minus phi of x. And I'm going to write this, you know, very simply as just the gradient of phi, integral of gradient of phi, you know, doing this. But doing this allows me to sort of um, not have to worry about um, not have to worry about local um, regularity of my gauge transform. Again, it's completely analogous to what we were just talking about, but just one dimension down, right? So we're now thinking about you know uh, the one sphere, the two sphere, instead of thinking about the two sphere and the three sphere, right? We're we're in R two, let's say. Okay, so now. And, and this gradient is a pure gauge, right? Pure gauge of uh, of the vector gauge potential, which is A. So what I'm going to do, just some hand waving. I'm going to say that psi of x is going to transform like this to y of A uh, sub y. Like this, just semi-classically, right? So these, the, this is the wave function I'm thinking about. Um, for example, maybe <clears throat> uh, just in or abstractly, abstractly in terms of quantum states, we have psi, um, and this operation is going to induce a phase. Uh, so this gauge transformation, gauge transformation is given by a translation. It's induced by a translation along C, along the path C, right? So for, for example, I have a state, uh, sorry, the entire state Let's say I have a I have like a effectively single particle state that describes, you know, just a single electron in this two D plane, and I have psi of x is equal to, you know, you you've seen this very very um, simply. Uh, uh, I mean, in the intro to M context, and of course, this gate transformation, uh, I I can apply a gate transformation. That sort of translates my x translate x to y along the path c, right? So that's that's like a unitary operator on my state, and I'm just going to say that the translation unitary operator is going to induce a um, phase on my state, and this phase is actually given by the the line integral of the vector potential because you have a non-trivial flux that's going through the um, going through the the two D um, system and when you have that non-trivial flux, it's going to couple non-trivially to your wave function, right? So um, just a segue. For you know, mathematically inclined people, here what I'm doing is that I have two pieces pieces of data, right? So I have the quantum piece, which is a U1 pre quantum bundle, and I also have another piece, which is the uh, electromagnetic field, right? Which is a U1 principal bundle. And I want to com couple these two together, and the, you know the simplest way is to couple them, couple them <clears throat> trivially, right? So it's just a trivial um, tensor product. Uh, e. Let's say oh, okay, pre quantum bundle. Uh, I'll say B like this B, and also a principal uh, bundle like this. So couple them trivially, E tensor U1, B, 
like this. So what that means is that I'm going to think about their gauge fields as the same thing. So um, the A, um, the, the U1 gauge field for the pre-quantum bundle is the same as the U1 principal bundle coming from uh, electromagnetism. So that's, that's a specific choice, and that's going to land me in a specific um, model of the quantum Hall effect. It's not important. It's just a segue to sort of show you guys um, treat, treat, connection, treat. They're, so so if you couple them trivially, then the U1 connection from each of the two bundles are sort of, they're on the same footing. So you can just add them together and then, um, you know, um, for example, treat one of them as a pure gauge and then um, treat the entire thing, the entire connection as a U1 connection uh, under a gauge transformation. So, you know, that's uh, one way to put it. And that's only if you couple them trivially. So, you know, you don't have any twists going on in the tensor product. But anyways, <clears throat> so this is what happens to the gauge transformation, right? So I think many of you guys can now uh, see what I'm going to do next, right? So what I'm going to do next is to literally just send x, you know, y equals x, but then I loop around, right? So I, I loop around c. c is a loop that encloses the flux, B. So B is in the Z direction. I'm not going to write down the vector. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to write down the vector um, components of B. It's always in the Z direction. So C is a loop that encloses the flux, right? So my quantum state is going to transform like this, right? As I said before, but this is nothing but the uh, span of C of the curl of A, right? I'm just using um, the Stokes theorem. So what's the span of C? The span of C is the area enclosed by the loop. It's just the uh, area enclosed by the loop in here. So that's the span of C. But also, this is nothing but e to the span of C. I just call this span of CS. I don't want to write span C every time. So it's S of my, of my um, magnetic flux, right? Let's say the magnetic flux is you know, constant in time or whatever. And this is nothing but e to the i of the flux. So it's just the flux. So then you think to yourself, OK, fine. You know, um, I, I want to, uh, if I just want to enforce, in, enforce. Again, I have the same problem as before. Well, not the problem, but I have the same freedom as previously, right? If I enforce gauge. Symmetry, then gauge symmetry, you know, this, I don't, I just have this, right? But that only requires me to have quantized flux. That's all I need to enforce gauge symmetry. So the states stay the same. Um, quantum hall uh, so this is called the Aron of Bohm effect 
And of course, if um, phi is non-trivial, come on, it's not working. You, um, you have a topological defect, topological defect. And it's very simple to see because, um, uh, you know, let's, you have um, a, and you, know, you write down as, um, as a pure gauge like this, as I've done before, but you have like V of X minus V of X. If this is non-zero, then you know th this thing cannot be cannot be a real number, right? Or in other words, if you parameterize, parameterize your loop C in terms of an angle that goes from zero to two pi, for example, then you have phi of two pi minus phi of zero is non-zero. So if you have like phi is proportional to the number of windings um, of your circle around itself so theta and theta for example right then you see that um this is actually n and so this is the uh 1d uh 1d winding number number and the above in the in the hedgehogs uh, that we've seen before, that's the two D winding number. So uh, there's a correspondence between. So this the okay. What I'm going to say is going to relate to. Uh, I'll write down another segue. Segue. Um, so winding numbers are. Homotopy invariance, right? Topy invariance. But the churn number are cohomological invariance. So how are they related? Well, there's this there's this thing called the um, the universal property universal property of um, principal uh, vector bundles, which says that if you have a principal G bundle, let's say uh, principal G bundle, and you have G acting on this, then let's say F is a classifying map, F is called a classifying map, and you have the uh, this is called the universal universal um, principal bundle. The universal principal bundle. Then E is actually isomorphic to the pullback of your classifying space um, by the universal principal bundle. So uh, say C like this. So this is true for every for every G. Um, for every nice enough G, I guess. Um, certainly true for compact Lie groups. Um, but yeah, so what that tells you is that if you have a characteristic class of this bundle here, then you can send that class to um, the principal, to, to a class of the principal bundle. And that class is only going to depend on G. So, um, uh, uh, char class uh, of um, the bundle E to M determined by um, pullback pullbacks of char class. Of, princ of universal principle bundle of um, E, G to B, G. And this thing only depends on G, only depends on, on G. So in other words, if we pick G to be um, 
to be u1, right? If g is u1, then we get the um, winding number. First, the 1D winding number uh, classified by E of U1, which is, you know, R, and to B of U1, which is Z. <clears throat> and we can understand um, principal U1 bundles, such as the pre-quantum bundle that we were talking about before that determines your wave function, right? So um, those kinds of bundles are completely just determined by um, the uh, the pullback of uh, of um, of this specific bundle here, and that it's um, yes okay. So <clears throat> in in this sense, um, the churn class class of pre quantum bundle bundle is determined by the pullback of your 1D winding number. Well, the churn number, sorry, churn number. OK, the <laughs> okay so first of all, the churn, num churn class of your pre-quantum bundle is determined by the churn class of the universal bundle, which is you know, the churn number is the winding number. So the churn number of your wave function, which classifies um, quantum hole effect, is going to be determined by the degree of the classifying map that you pick times the windy winding number. <clears throat> and this is an integer, right? So that's why the flux is quantized, because phi the magnetic flux, right? It's this. It depends on both your choice of loop and also what phi is, right? So <clears throat> the choice of loop is going to um, determine the 1D winding number. And phi, you know, it's a, it's a map from S1 to S1. So it's going to have a certain degree. And that's where the correspondence came from. And of course, if you pick like G equals SU2, right? Then it's the second um, first churn number. The second churn number. Whoops. Uh, it's determined by the degree of um, uh, uh, of the hedgehog degree of your hedgehog hedgehog times the 2d winding number so that's there's a correspondence there but you have to make sure that your bundle is in fact a principal g bundle but anyways okay that's a long <laughs> segue but anyways in terms of um the quantum hole effects and the Aronov Bohm effect. Aronov uh, uh, Bohm uh, effect. That's what happens. Your uh, flux just needs to be um, uh, quantized. It doesn't have to be zero, it just has to be quantized for your um, single particle states to be invariant under gauge symmetry, right? So as Infinity Flat have mentioned this this thing, uh, or or rather, this this thing here is a is a instance of um, large gauge transformation. Why is it called large? Because it's over a finite area. It's over a finite uh, region. Transform. <clears throat> but yeah, you, you see a whole bunch of like very interesting um, stuff coming from this uh, line of reasoning, and also something called a PRL's uh, substitution, uh, which sort of builds this uh, engaging variance in directly um, into a Hamiltonian. But 
yeah, that's something I'll talk about later. Oh, well, not later, but um, we can talk about that uh, after my talk. So now the second thing is how is this related to quantum hall? <clears throat> Um, so there are a few ways to understand quantum hall. First of all, is to use you know a semi-classical approach. Um, the semi, well, most of them use semi-classical approach. The thing is that you have this uh, key, key, log then flux threading argument, argument, which basically uh, leverages on, on the uh, aronov bohm effect to count your charge transport. So the setup is like this, right? So I have a band of something. A thin cylindrical band like this. And Lachlan says, OK, let's say that I have a, I have a magnetic flux that comes out. Uh, perpendicular to the band. And what he wants to do is that he wants to count, um, well, not count, count is sort of assuming that you have flux quantization to, to um, compute, 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 transport, of charge from side one to side two. <coughs> and uh, that's in the presence of, um, of a flux. So what he has shown, the log lens flux threading argument, what he has shown is that you know, quantized, quantized, charged, charge transport is equivalent to quantized flux threading. In other words, if you thread a one single flux quantum, for example, right, through this band here, what you're going to do is that you're going to pump a single unit charge from the side one to the side two of band. But conversely, right, if you pump just this charge from side one to side two, you're going to induce a quantized flux through the band. And that's where um, quantum Hall effect comes in, right? So what's what's quantum Hall? Quantum Hall is um, the observation of um, so, so you have contacts uh, here, and you have a magnetic field, B contacts. So the electric field is going to drive current like this, current. But quantum Hall effect is that you have, you have so, so this is the direction of x, and this is the direction of y. Um, so quantum Hall effect says that you have like even at this setup, right? You have contacts just in the direction of X and you drive a voltage or a current through that direction. So classically, you just see, um, well, I mean, classically without the magnetic current, you're just, see, without the magnetic field, you just see charges going from negative X to positive X, right? But classically, if you have a magnetic field, you have a Lorentz force on the charge carriers. So that's going to, you know, drive your um, drive your uh, uh, charge carriers. Um, classically, for example, electrons in a circle, right? Because uh, this is flux because of Lorentz force. But classically, there's nothing that says that your charge transport uh, has to be quantized, right? It, it doesn't say that your current has to be integer multiple or something, like your conductivity has to be in, integral multiple of something, right? But in the quantum sense, in what we just talked about, the Aronov-Bohm effect, the um, 
Lachlan flux threading argument, all of that implies that you have a quantized charge transport and hence a quantized um, hole conductivity, which is in the, so it's an off diagonal hole conductivity. So hole conductivity is quantized in a 2D EG. So what's 2D EG? It's a two-dimensional electron gas. So like a, like a dilute electron uh, gas confined to move in just two dimensions. So, and um, that's different from the classical case, right? Classically, uh, cool. classically, no quantization uh, is seen. So we know that the quantum hole effect is truly, tr truly quantum. It's a truly quantum effect. There is no um, classical analog for this effect. And what's even more exciting is that quantum hole effect is a topological effect, right? Because it's characterized by the 1D uh, winding number. So um, it's completely topological. Quantum hole is also topological. As we've argued previously, right up here, um, in in this flux threading argument, so it, it might be good to go through like uh, Rob's original paper to see his actual argument for why this is true. Um, but yeah, uh, quantum hole effect is topological. It's given by the 1D uh, winding number. 1D winding number. And again, that assumes that your, your gauge field has a singularity in the, in the origin, right? So your, in particular, your field, uh, your, your gauge connection cannot be smooth. But that's kind of, I, I mean, that's kind of um, obvious, right? In this setup, because you have um, a non-trivial gauge. Uh, sorry, you have a non-trivial uh, magnetic field. Or rather, you have a non-trivial magnetic flux. <laughs> so in this sense, your um, in, in 2D, this flux sort of behaves like a monopole, right? It sort of behaves like a monopole, um, a, a 2D monopole. But it, it, it's a fact that you can set this up in 3D without just some exotic things happening. By exotic, I mean like you actually have to find a 3D monopole <laughs> um, um, in, in, in reality. Like you don't have to do that. But if you just thread a magnetic field through a 2D sample, then the 2D electrons in the plane is going to see this magnetic flux as a 2D monopole. <clears throat> is non-trivial. So <coughs> the magnetic flux uh flux core is sort of like a 2d so a 3d magnetic flux is sort of like a 2d magnetic monopole okay uh and so so that's a very quick rundown of integer in integer quantum hole um, effect. Um, because, you know, obviously we've just been talking about the winding, winding number, which is integral. 
But there's, of course, as some of you might know, there's also the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect, where it, if you tune your sample to you know low enough temperatures or uh, high enough um, magnetic fields, then um, you see some plateau in in the whole resistivity at uh, sorry in the whole conductivity at uh, fractional values of the filling quantized into DG in terms terms of filling but that's 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 not really important the main point thing main point i want to emphasize is that you know in quantum hall effect whole conductivity is quantized and that's a uh, purely quantum effect you don't see that in classical there's no reason for classical whole um, currents to be quantized but yeah uh, uh, you know and versus fractional <laughs> Uh, of course, imaging quantum Hall effects in in through you know throughout throughout the above, it's all single particle, right? A single particle or one body or non-interacting, non-interacting, right? And that the the reason for this is because um, uh, like for to to just see the quantization and energies of um, of the whole conductivity, you don't need to include uh, electron electron correlation. Um, so that's sort of like what um, I guess simulations people have done um, that sort of give us theorists the uh, the the courage um, or the um, the understanding to sort of build models of integer quantum Hall effect from non-interacting um, models, right? So there are some effective models, models for integer quantum Hall, and I'll list some of them that I find personally interesting. And one is statistical. Statistical transignments. Statistical um, transignments. And, and this is in 2D, OK? Statistical transignments in 2D. So um, the transignments action is given by a statistical gauge field. And this is proportional to the you know R two and F. It's just a field strength. I'm not taking the square of it, right? So it's just a field strength. Uh, and the other one's uh, Bray group formalism uh, and uh, semi-classical cyclotron orbits. <clears throat> so here, and, and this break group can actually, um, yeah, actually that's, um, why is this the gauge So the evolution of break is a gauge transmission to zero. What? I don't understand. Can you argue for the current being the only along the, ah, okay, of course. Yeah. So. Actually, Lula brings up a very good point, is that the, the currents, the whole currents, are only localized on the edge of the sample. So here's why. <laughs> this is actually the introduction to the bulk edge correspondence. So what does it say? Bulk edge correspondence, what does it say? It says the bulk topological invariant uh, invariant counts uh, edge um, chiral gap gapless edge chiral modes chiral gapless edge modes um, chiral gapless edge modes.
So in the very simple, very simple uh, example of quantum hole, integer quantum hole, um, what we have is that uh, when you have non-zero flux, right? Non-zero flux and flux is quantized. What happens is that you you get these um, you get these uh, vortices forming in your bulk, and these vortices are literally just um, the, your your electron, you know, your currents. Like they're they're actually currents. So you have like these uh, some classical cyclotron orbits that sort of wind around uh, in, in your 2D. Field in your 2D sample. So of course, um, this relates to the break group formalism I was talking about, but you know, on the edge, right? These these cyclotron orbits can't move out of the sample, right? Because it's it's an all vacuum outside. It's zero, so it can't move out. So it has to bounce back like this, and then bounce back again, bounce back, bounce back, and bounce back, 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 right? And so all these um, electrons undergo semi-classically these uh, cyclotron orbits locally. Around each point in the in the um, in, in the two D sample, but near the edge, right? These cyclotron orbits have a certain radius. Uh, omega c, which is actually proportional to the flux quantum. Uh, quantum. Uh, I forgot what exactly the the formula is, but they have a finite radius. So near the edge, you're going to see this effect of just the cyclotron orbits bouncing back um, whenever it hits the edge. And this is going to induce, uh, you know, if, if the uh, electrons are all going this way, then of course it's going to induce a edge current that goes around like this. So edge current induced by bulk uh, vortices. And these bulk vortices are topologically non-trivial, right? And that's that's what we mean by bulk top uh, topological invariants, um, because these bulk vortices are uh, characterized by the one D winding number, and it just so happens that the one D uh, winding numbers counts the chiral gapless edge modes on your edge. Uh, and the reason being is, again, you have to go through the um, Loughlin flux threading argument to understand, you know, you, 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 you thread a um, quantized flux, and that's equivalent to charge transport. <coughs> but yeah. And another way to understand this, another uh, way to understand bulk edge, um, Correspondence is that you know we we know topological states <clears throat> cannot be uh, continuously continuously deformed uh, to each other. You know, un unless in in the same same uh, topological state. So what that means is that, for example, if you have a quantum hole system that's in a topological state of, for example, one, right, and you have vacuum outside, then you cannot. There is no way to continuously deform the quantum hole system in the bulk. Which has you know turn number one to um, whatever is outside, which is the vacuum. You cannot continuously deform uh, your system like that, which means that there must be some kind of gap closure right on the edge, because topology is gap protected. Uh, 
so that that's a main point that um, I'm probably not going to talk about. But um, but yeah, why why do we say it's gapless? Because the gap has to close across the uh, the these domain walls. Right. So, um, like, the offshot is that something must happen at the edge, because we know that we cannot continuously deform a um, quantum hole state to a trivial state. <coughs> okay. So I think um, that's all I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about fractional quantum hole. Um, because that's a, another can of worms. But um, I think I'm going to stop here for the uh, quantum hole portion. Uh, if anybody have any questions, go ahead and ask. Um, so the uh, quantization condition on the integral of uh, the the gauge transformation, um, or sorry, mm -hmm. just the gauge transformation on psi. Um, you're demanding that psi is basically not multi-valued, right? <clears throat> If you uh, just transport along a curve and end up at the same point, so you're, you're kind expecting of... the same state, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. But at the same time, don't we, I guess, not care if a state is changed by a phase? Don't we identify just all different phases of a state to be the same physical state? Yeah, but um, it's a it's a physical... Um, when, when the phase that you acquire is has a physical meaning, I guess the, the procedure, um, the phase identification procedure is um, a bit more modeled. Um, The point is that you only require, as you said, you only require um, your states to return to the same band or return to the same uh, ray of, of states after a gauge transformation. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have non-degenerate states, right? If your ground state is non-degenerate, then you only have one band. So, um, uh, that means uh, yeah, well, I mean, in the bulk, you certainly can't measure anything. Yeah, in terms of um, non-degeneracy of the ground state, you um, in the bulk, that implies that you have some sort of um, topological defect. I guess the because uh, I don't know how exactly um, people try to detect topological things because what you're saying is that you're you only care about phases because people only you know um, people only detect measurements observables uh, sorry measurements of us of observables right which is sure, just yeah. expectation. So we don't care about um, the phases. But I believe the entire point is that if you have a U1 gauge, right, which you know you couple your uh, wave function to a U1 gauge, you need, in order for your theory to be consistent, you need your um, wave function to, to be like gauge variant on the nose. So that's that's okay. a observation. Yeah, that's an observation that is sort of independent of experimental um, facts or measurements, uh, whatever. But yeah, I mean, certainly in the bulk, I don't. 
aside from braiding, right? Um, I don't really know how experimentalists can see anything in the bulk that's topologically non-trivial. People just use the bulk edge correspondence, right? You just look at the edge and um, mm -hmm. uh, you know see if there's any quantized charge transport or something like that. But um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other questions? Not a. If not, then I will uh, move on to my final topic, which is direct quantization. No? Okay. So, Derek monopoles and quantization. <clears throat> so, we're going to return to 3D, 3D space. And we're of course we're going to have like you know the two D winding number and stuff that I was just talking about. Um, but now we actually want to quantize our uh, turn assignments theory now because previously we had uh, you know just classical E and M, um, and I argued um, through purely. symmetry of the turn assignments action but here we want to you know treat that quanti treat that quantization as a quantum effect uh, in essence well okay i shouldn't i shouldn't say that because magnetic charges are by themselves just um okay you know what let me say this i'm going to start from Start from uh, U1 churn Simons, Abelian churn Simons. And then I'm going to couple uh, in R3. I'm going to couple a spinner. to CS, and then I'm going to quantize it. Well, not spinner, sorry, uh, just a scalar. scalar. So here, I'm literally just thinking about a particle on the sphere. I'm, I'm going to quantize that particle. So as you said, uh, as you've seen before, again, if A is like singular, at zero singular at zero then this is s2 we obtain from r3 take away zero or actually let me just say that we allow a to be locally singular and then we're going to enclose um a unisphere around that singular point and that singular point is exactly where the magnetic monopole is. And this is the unisphere around the magnetic monopole. It doesn't have to be at mm -hmm. the origin, right? Singular locally. <clears throat> and I want to quantize this uh, uh, particle that is moving around. <clears throat> In, in this uh, in this sphere. Oh, on this sphere, sorry. I'm going to quantize the particle that's moving on this sphere. So to begin with, let's think about just quantizing a particle on a sphere, right? So what can we do? How do we do that? The point is um, we have um, the Hamiltonian. What's the Hamiltonian for a particle just moving on a sphere? Um, 
that is of course L squared, proportional to L squared. Right, it's a free particle on a sphere, right? And L L is the uh, total um, angular momentum. And what I'm going to do to aid in my quantization, right? Aid in quantization. Uh, I'm going to treat L as a generator of SL3. So the Lie algebra of rotation symmetry, because it's a, it's a sphere, right? So the entire system, the entire Hamiltonian is going to be symmetric under rotations in three space. So I'm going to treat L, the uh, each component of the angular momentum as a generator in SL3. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start by quantizing a scalar, right? Let's say the uh, the wave function. Start with a wave function. Function, which is you know a complex valued scalar uh, that goes from you know the unit sphere to uh, C, and we also require it to be uh, uh, sing valued uh, so here okay let me not say this because this is going to change when we have a magnetic module but I'll say this in absence Psi. Psi is going to be psi is going to be um, psi is going to be single value. And two, the second step, what we're going to do is we're going to impose um, a sole theory covariance. Equivariance. What that means is that we're going to force psi to transform under a certain representation, a complex representation, like this, right? So, uh, lambda s is some complex number, non zero complex number. So, this is c take away zero, non-zero complex number, very important. And S is an element in SO3, right? <clears throat> so now you guys will see why quantization sort of thinks, um, why quantum mechanics cares about the projective representation instead of the classical group, right? It's because so three, uh, this this equivariance equivariance is, uh, I guess, generated by the classical Lie algebra, which is isomorphic to SU two, right? Which is the quantum algebra. And which is just a uh, a uh, a lift a Z two lift double lift uh, a double lift of the classical algebra uh, sorry of the classical group. So enforcing this equivariance is going to lead to um, certain. Uh, uh, changes in how we think about the uh, wave function. So of course, that's what we can do. And of course, we can also write S as a as some uh, L, I'm going to write L. J dotted with N, okay? 
Uh, so, okay, first of all, I have a group element, and I'm going to parameterize this group element in terms of the um, parameters on the Lie algebra, right? So um, I'm going to write generators j dotted with n, right? But j are the generators generates uh, SU2. So how do we impose uh, quantum states like this? Even though the wave function transforms, you know, just under 1D representation, the quantum states can transform under, you know, any irreducible representation that we can have, right? So in other words, S psi is going to, in general, transform as a unitary um, operator acting on psi. So this unitary operator, unitary operator, when, you know, S, is, S of n is parameterized by a unit vector times dotted with the, um, with the uh, generators of SU2, when this is the case, then the unitary operator is exactly the Wigner D matrices. And what we can do is that we can just decompose, um, decompose, and this leads to a decomposition of um, our quantum states in angular momentum eigenstates, right? So that's very simple, um, very straightforward. And of course, spin comes about from the fact that, you know, J is, um, you have, uh, I, I, I guess I can write this or, or rather, you know, momentum eigenstates. Ah, sorry. Let me just write down L is equal to 2J plus 1, and this is an integer. So, of course, J can be half integers. So, the, these facts come about from just, you know, doing um, the Carton decomposition. Um, sorry, the decomposition of SU2 in terms of its um, roots. Root the comp of SU2, the Lie algebra SU2. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, so I think everybody is familiar with this procedure, right? So you know, like you guys know what these J's are J1, J, uh, J-I, J-J satisfies I-J-K of J-K. So this is the uh, Lie algebra structure for the generators of SU2. Mm -hmm. In other words, yep. So in other words, the Levi chi beta tensor is the structural constants, right? Um, and this is actually very, um, I guess, if you understand that, in terms of you know SO three being the sum and be, being the um, rotation group in three D, you'll see why <laughs> Levi Chirita tensor shows up here. Um, but anyways, but yeah, that's the case without monopoles, right? Because we can um, enforce our wave functions to be uh, single valued. But if we have a <clears throat> 
if we have a monopole, right? If we have a monopole like this, what's going to happen is that um, the Wigner D matrices are going to be modified. Uh, let me just say this here. Uh, so the procedure is going to be the same, okay? The procedure is the same, but we just have to keep track of the, um, the magnetic charge. So the magnetic charge is going to lead to a certain um, deformation of our quantization, which is quite interesting if you uh, think about just a general mathematical uh, uh, statement that goes into that. So I'll just write it down. Uh, if magnetic monopole is present, what the fuck? Present, then quanti, uh, then Wigner D matrices matrices are deformed. Um, so why? why? Why is that the case, right? Again, we are going to start with a Hamiltonian that's proportional to, you know, the angle of momentum and your total angle of momentum uh, generators of SL3. But of course, we're coupling it to a um, magnetic field, right? Coupling it to a magnetic uh, monopole. So the picture is this. Dirac quantization. Quantization picture. Well, technically, when we say, you know, K or 2D winding number or whatever, that is already um, Dirac quantization that quantizes the uh, magnetic uh, charge. So, Dirac quantization picture, what we're going to think about is that going to think about a infinitely long solenoid, uh, semi-infinite, infinite solenoid that ends at the magnetic monopole. Right? So, um, this solenoid is going to produce um, a magnetic field, uh, but the magnetic field is going to just flow along the solenoid. And then at the end, it's going to leak out like this, exactly like how a monopole behaves. But because you have a magnetic field at this end, right? This is going to look like a hedgehog. But because you have a solenoid coming out, the solenoid, <clears throat> uh, the solenoid intersects, intersects S2, the unit sphere. And there's going to be a point on S2 at which your gauge potential is singular. Because you know your your B field is non-zero here. Um, well, I guess um, it looks like a flux core, right? Just on the uh, on the on the sphere, uh, this point looks like a flux core. So think back to um, your what we were just talking about, the quantum Hall effect. Uh, a flux core is going to induce a singular point in your um, in your um, gauge potential. But here we're sort of like just compactifying everything into the sphere. 
so what's going to happen is that because um, we have this uh, so we're going to suppose you know we do have a uh, quantization of magnetic flux and this is Dirac quantization um, that's to um, curl of a this equals to you know m and the magnetic well i'll just say magnetic charge and this is quantized and this is direct quantization you know you can argue this uh, either from topological point of view um thinking about a just um finding a non-trivial uh, pre-quantum bundle on s2 or um you can think about it in terms of just the uh, d matrices and that's what we're going to see hmm. the reason being that we need of course gauge invariance right of our state gauge gauge invariance and if we if so there's a certain gauge choice that we can pick right you can gauge choice so i'm going to list out the uh choice uh, i'm going to just go through the main uh the main arguments i'm not going to do any computation because i don't like doing that but um i forgot what exactly it is but it's a g theta and r or z so i'm going to say you know this is the south pole right south pole and this south pole um has coordinates uh, r equals one and well as coordinates z equals z equals minus one right so there's a gauge choice uh, for which you can pick your vector potential to have z plus one um, and its uh, components and its phi component uh yes that's right so it's actually very interesting because this this has to be the symplectic form on s2 like your magnetic flux has to be the symplectic form but um your magnetic field sorry has to be a symplectic form but anyways that's that's not important um so anyways there's a gauge choice such that this is the case and <clears throat> if you do if you enforce the gauge invariance but also the su so3 invariance there's going to be a non uh, commutativity right uh, between these rotational elements and this gauge transformation this uh, i'm going to write it as uh, you know gauge transformation x like this v of x or or a large gauge transformation so they're not going to commute and why is that it's because you know in in this setup right we're sort of already assuming that uh, the gauge field is singular at this at the south pole so whenever we rotate our um wave function right when we rotate our way rotate our wave function we have to sort of also rotate the singularity of your gauge to wherever the uh, rotation takes the wave function to <clears throat> does that not sure if that makes sense but i mean not sure if that um, makes sense to you guys but um, that's the way i think about it 
<clears throat> and specifically, you can sort of pick. Um, you can still pick uh, quadratic Casimirs. You know, L squared and L Z. Uh, well, let's see. Hurry the fuck up, piece of shit whiteboard. Okay, so I'm going to write it down. So it's like this. This. So what's um what's it going to commute to, right? So it's going to commute to to a phase, um, but that phase is going to be proportional to a Euler rotation. So as you've said. As uh, we've written here before, so this is a uh, Euler angle parameterization, right? So this is an Euler angle parameterization, but there's a specific um, Euler angle that generates this um, this this uh, non this commutator, and we can pick pick the generator to be three, and it just so happens that the parameter is the, the well, it's not just so happens, but it's, it's like built in, right? Because the gauge, gauge field has this. The parameter is exactly the monopole charge, the magnetic monopole charge. Monopole charge. So I'm leaving out some uh, computation details. But this is where the deformation is going to occur. This causes this commutator is going to cause will cause a deformation in the Wigner matrices. And the deformation is very simple, right? The deformation is uh, just going to, um, so, M, J, M, like this. Deformation is just going to translate the uh, magnetic Well, it's going to translate the spin. Um, well, not the spin. Sorry, the um, the the uh, Z components uh, of the uh, of the angular momentum, and it, that comes directly from our choice of this commutator. So there's a certain um, gauge choice that allows us to compute this commutator as this. So, for example, if you rotate. Um, in a so three and u x the large gauge transformation large gauge something like this. So this deformation, so so. What we call in the mathematical community is that um, the monopole uh, charge is the germ of uh, deformation. So, as you see, and in other words, topology is. Well, topology deforms quantization, basically. Deforms quantization. 
So of course, if you want to represent, if you want to represent psi as a function, as L2 function on your two sphere, then in the absence of monopole, right? In the absence of monopole, if J, if you have integer spin, uh, in the absence of monopole, of course, you, you get back the uh, spherical harmonics, right? Harmonics for integer spin. I mean, uh, if it's, Hank, yep. Uh, Cronum is saying he may have to stop recording soon due to meetings. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I'm almost at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have integer spin, then you get spherical harmonics from the um, Wigner D matrices. But let's say if QM is one, right? Even if you have energy spin, you won't get um, presence of monopole. Uh, let's say QM is one, your, your uh, monopole charge is unit, then you won't get no spherical harmonics because spherical harmonics are um, singular, sorry, single valued, right? Throughout S2. It's single valued over S2. If you have half spin, then it's single valued over the double cover of, the, of, of S2. So if you wind around S2, you'll come back to minus of the D matrix. But even if you have uh, E even for integer spin. As you see here, right, the uh, the Z component is going to be um, moved to one half of Q. So again, this topology sort of tells you that you have to pick a um, non-trivial double cover uh, of your sphere. And your spherical harmonics, even for energy spin, is not going to lift, uh, well, it's not going to descend, I should say, to a single valued function on the sphere because of the non-trivial topology, because of the monopole. So it's a very key point to keep in mind that, you know, this, this is an anomaly, right? Quantum anomaly. Um, quantum, quantum anomaly. So topology plays, like not only in um, statistical systems, um, it also plays a very major role in quantum mechanics and QFT, for instance. So, yeah. And I am finished. If anybody have any questions, go ahead. Well, I want to... Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing so you know Chronom can actually get to um, get to processing the entire thing. And I'll try to I'm not sure how to actually work the whiteboard, but I'll try to export this thing. Yeah, that would be good because I think everyone was seeing uh, occasional pauses. Right. Uh, and jumps in in the screen. Okay. Uh, PNG. It's just a picture. What? It's weird. But yeah. Um. I guess it's a free discussion period. If you want to have any. Uh, if you have anything to ask or to comment on, please go ahead. Let's see if this works. What the hell?
So, of course, yeah. experimentally, we seem to have established that there is either 